Oh, isn't that cute? Um, I used to, I can't see anybody back there. There we go. Um, I used to actually despise Christmas. I used to not like it at all. I used to not understand it. I, as you, many of you guys know, I grew up in a third world country in Hong Kong, China and everything. And we didn't really celebrate Christmas. Our Christmas consisted of unwrapping gifts um, and going to McDonald's. That's basically what we, we did for Christmas Day. Um, until I got married. Then Rachel's amazing love about Christmas slowly went into the hard heart of Dave and the scroogeness of Christmas and everything. And I started to love Christmas and slowly but surely, especially if you have a mother-in-law that just like saves up all year round and you know you're going to get good gifts. Thank you, Terry. All right. <laughs> that makes it better. But in reality, two weeks before Thanksgiving, Two weeks before Thanksgiving, I walked into Coles. And I started to hear this tune. Then I'm like, that, that sounds familiar. That sounds like something I've heard before. And then I just stopped and listened to the music that was going all around the building. And it was joy to the world. And I'm like, did, did I have a seizure? Did I have a stroke? And was I like... Um, put in the hospital for, for a whole month and all now it's Christmas time and, and now we're, we're celebrating Christmas this December. What have I missed? And I realized it was two weeks before Thanksgiving and they were playing Christmas music. And then I noticed something. And I noticed how Christmas decorations, where they started back in the seasonal, and now they're slowly kind of being, bringing forward. Then I went to Walmart, and Thanksgiving stuff was there, but right next to Thanksgiving stuff was what? Christmas stuff. And I start looking down the hallway whenever I go to, to Walmart, and they start bringing uh, these huge boxes out. And on the side of it, it's Christmas. And I'm like, Thanksgiving is not even here yet. Can we just enjoy the pilgrims? Can we just enjoy eating? Can we just enjoy being thankful for a second before this craziness goes on? A week after that, a week before Thanksgiving, more Christmas stuff and more Christmas stuff and more Christmas stuff. And then Black Friday happens on Thanksgiving now. I don't know about you, but Christmas is not a season of joy to the world, Jesus has come. It is joy to the world. Let's see how much money can come from Christmas. And I think we as Christ followers have been sucked into this. And in my mind, in my heart, and some of you guys saw in my post on Facebook, why Christmas music? I forgot what I said. But in my heart, I'm like Charlie Brown. And I hope some of you guys are like Charlie Brown. Please, someone tell me the meaning of Christmas. And I'm here today to share with you the meaning of Christmas. Is that all right? Is that good? I want us to, first off, I want you guys to know this. It's going to allude to the fact that all this stuff on this side is bad. To tell you the truth... All this stuff you see right here is actually very much good. It's very good. But what we as Christians, commercial Christians in America, have taken this stuff and elevated above this. This is what we see. We see the lights. We see, we see the gifts. We see Santa. We see the tree. We see all this stuff. And over here... There's no light. It's dull. It's just a manger scene. It's just a baby crying. No, that baby, this little baby here, is God in human form coming to this earth, not as a king in a palace, but this baby Jesus came. Because he loves you. We don't deserve this. 
Because for one, we love that. And we love ourselves. This Christmas, let's do this. Let us unplug from this. And why don't we bring our whole attention and our heart into plugging into... Is it on? Anti-dramatic. Boom shakalaka. There you go. <laughs> into that. But think about that. Just that illustration, just for a quick second. It didn't light up. We can plug in. We can put together as much musicals. We can, we can be all holier than thou. We can do all that stuff. But until the light switch goes on in our minds, in our hearts, it's going to stay dull. It's going to stay dull. So listen, I, I really, I mean, this is not shame on you or shame on me. This is how joyful and how awesome this season can be if we unplug and replug and rethink Christmas. Sound good? All right. So the very first thing that I want to talk about, since I, I told you that all this stuff is actually what? Good. I've had many pastors from, let's just say, very traditional type of churches look at all of this and say, heathenistic, pagan, terrible stuff that's not good. It's all about that. And it's true that many of this stuff started pagan. Who likes St. Nick? Actually, out of all this stuff, this is the one thing that we don't tell our children about. We, we don't. We don't. But we should. Let me explain. This Santa used to be not Santa. The reason why this came about was because of... Watch this. The Santa Claus we see today, with his jolly belly, white beard, and sleigh, has actually been inspired by many great people in our history, the most popular being Saint Nicholas. A nobleman born in the Greece, Nicholas was born to wealthy parents in the village of Patara. After his parents died, he decided to sell what he owned, give the money to the poor, and devote his life to God. Devoting his life to help the needy earned him the honor of becoming the Bishop of Myra. One of his most famous good works was his secret network designed to help the poor children. These and many more are attributes of St. Nicholas that can be seen in the present day story of Santa Claus. We've got this verse. This, I believe, is where St. Nicholas came up with the idea of being devoted to Christ. Let me read it to you. It's in Matthew chapter 25, in verse uh, 35. It says this, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me, some, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was, I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you went to visit me. Then the righteous would answer him, this is Jesus, this is the king, would answer Jesus, the king, and said this, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you? Or when were you thirsty and give you something to drink? When were you a stranger and we invited you in? Or needed clothes and you clothed me? When you did, when were you sick and in prison and we went to visit you? Then the king, King Jesus, replied to this, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for who? Me. St. Nicholas. He, I love that word. We talked about that. Lord. He what himself to God. Devoted. Oh, I'm glad you caught that. He devoted himself to God. He said, God, you are more important than anything else. You are more important than my riches. You are more important than anything else. You are more important than everything I believe in because it's about you. And what he did, he sold his, he gave up his fortune and gave it to the poor. And that's why we have Santa. That's how we have St. Nicholas. So what I want to encourage you guys to do is this. Parents, 
When you see Santa Claus, before you put your child up on the, the, the lap of Santa, and he asks your child, have you been good? Have you been good? What do you want for Christmas? Before you do that, talk to your child about who Santa represents. Santa represents Christians who are willing to sacrifice all that they have to give to those who don't have. That is Santa. That is St. Nicholas. But what we have done, American Christians, is we have taken Santa. We've added this reindeers. We've added the, the reindeer with the no, what, Rudolph. We've, re, we've, we've know that Santa's watching us all the time. And we use that to, to, to prod our kids to be good. You know what? We need to prod them with the love of Jesus and say, you're making Jesus sad. You're making God sad. You know what? It's God's eyes, not Santa's eyes, that we need to focus our kids' attention on. Now, if you tell your kids there is a Santa, that's great, and that's fine. But do a little bit of due diligence and teach your children who this really is. And then think, what can you do this Christmas to be more like St. Nicholas? Who do you know right now that doesn't have? Who do you know this Christmas that might need a gift. Notice I said need a gift, not just want a gift, because this is what we've done. And I am so guilty about this. We pad our tree filled with gifts. We spend hundreds of dollars on gifts because we want to be the best parents in the world. We don't want to ever make our children unhappy. But imagine this. Imagine spending just half of your money on Christmas gifts because, by the way, your children don't need any more gifts or toys. They don't. And I don't like Toys R Us anymore because Toys R Us, they send you this catalog that's this thick. And they give it to you and they put it on your front door and they say, buy me. Buy. And the kids see it, they start circling it, and then you feel obligated to get it. Let's change that this year. Let's try. Half of our Christmas money, go ahead and do something that St. Nicholas would do and ultimately what God would want you to do. And that is to feed the poor, love the poor, take care of those who are in need. And by doing that you will show the signs of being devoted to God as a Christ follower actually, truly should be. Sound good? All right. So St. Nicholas is not bad. But we need to make sure we rethink who Santa really is. All right. Then the next one is this. Um, the Christmas tree. The Christmas tree. This is the big one. This is, this is the huge one that, that people in churches get, get upset about um, that, that don't do their due diligence to, to read up on it. The tree is a beautiful thing. Who's actually done research about, about Christmas trees? Anybody raise your hand? Oh, you just decide to put a tree in your house just because you have done it for centuries? Is that right? Do you understand that this tree that is in your house and my house, that's in the church building out there, is actually and was a pagan worship and idol? What you and I have in our house right now is an idol. But I'm going to tell you the truth. There's good news. Watch this. The tradition of the Christmas tree comes from northern Germany, where for thousands of years, tribes decorated with tree branches. And before they knew about Jesus, even linked certain trees to make-believe God. One giant oak tree was called the Oak of Thor. If anyone cut it down, they believed the god Thor would strike them dead. Well, a Christian named Boniface came to northern Germany to tell them about Jesus. They said, we don't believe in Jesus, we believe in Thor. Look, here's his tree. 
Boniface had to find a way to show them Thor wasn't real. So guess what he did? Picked up an axe and chopped down the tree. Nothing. So everyone realized Thor was fake and started believing in Jesus instead. Well, according to the story, Boniface then pointed to a small fir tree that was growing right next to Thor's oak tree and said, This will be your new symbol. You use this tree to build your homes. Let Christ be at the center of your households. Its leaves remain evergreen in the darkest days. Let Christ be your constant light. Its branches reach out to embrace, and its top points to heaven. Let Christ be your comfort and guide. Isn't that awesome? Isn't it awesome that some missionary would go into an area and say, Paul did this in the Bible, would go into an area and say, you're worshiping this, you're worshiping this idol, you're worshiping this object. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you about the Jesus that you need so that your life can be changed. So this is what I want you to think about the tree for a second. Two things. Number one is this. Know that the tree used to be a pagan thing, but God took this tree through a missionary and used this to allow people to point to God. So before you, and if you decorated your tree like we have, we should have, go ahead and sat down with our children and thought and said, you know what? This tree used to be used for bad but God is now using it for good if we have the right mindset and right attitude. Because this, do you realize that you used to be bad? You used to be a sinner. Do you realize that? But now you are redeemed. If you're a Christ follower, you're redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you are no longer in God's eyes bad. You are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that, you can put your head up high and say, I've screwed up today. I'm going to screw up tomorrow. But God can still use this screwed up, sinful person for his glory. And that's what they did. That's what the missionary came in and did. So I want to encourage you with this. This Christmas season, who are you going to tell about Jesus? I bet 95% of the households you go into this Christmas will have some sort of a Christmas tree up. How awesome would it be if you were, you were that missionary who came into your family this Christmas and pointed out the truth about it, that it used to be bad, but God said, no, I'm going to use it to minister and to tell other people about Jesus. And ultimately, it's about the cross of Jesus Christ. Point people to the tree that Jesus Christ died on. Point them to the truth about Jesus. Tell them the reason why we celebrate Christmas is because Jesus Christ died on a tree, which, like the end of the clip, points us to heaven. Imagine the conversations that you could start this Christmas with your family by saying, you know what? It's awesome that we decorate the tree. You have a beautiful tree. But why do you have a tree? And start that conversation. Do a little bit more research about it. Find out about <coughs> Martin Luther and how he took this and he took this pagan thing and made it even more practical about Jesus. Do you know that this baby Jesus that is so sweet and has a peaceful look on his face. 30 years later on, died on the cross. A rugged sinner's cross. Because he loves you. When you see a Christmas tree, I want you to see Jesus. And how God took the bad and has used it for good to point people to Jesus. Sound good? All right, so let's rethink that a little bit. So we got Santa, we, we've got the tree. <sighs> I don't know if I want to even mention this one. The gift. <laughs> Dave, you're not saying to rethink gifts, are you? Dave, you're not saying we need to take all of our gifts and give it to the poor. You're not saying that the gifts are bad, are you? And I'm like saying no, but 
it has been turned into kind of a bad thing. Because gifts are not supposed to make us happy. Jesus is supposed to make us happy. And Jesus is the only one who's going to make us happy. So why do we have gifts during Christmas? Anybody know why we have gifts during Christmas? The what? I, okay, speak up so I can actually hear you. Why do we have gifts during Christmas? Okay, the three wise men. That, that's one of them. But let me read that to you about the wise men. It says this in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. I think that's actually the wrong verse. But on coming... Oh, it is. Yeah, Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. On coming to the house, they saw the child with the mother Mary. Who was the child? Jesus. What did they do? What, read this with me. And they what to him? Bow. Bowed down and worshipped him. During Christmas, we worship Santa. We worship gifts. We worship commercialism. We worship idols. And we worship ourselves and say, how can we look better this Christmas? How can we go into our families and look all religious and how awesome? But in reality, we need to worship Jesus. Christmas is not about Xmas. And some people say, well, they put X there because of this or because of that. If you are going to say Xmas, and if you're going to write Xmas, why on earth are you going to do that? If you can, at any moment of the time, any other season on the face of the planet, you can put Christ in everything. Christ is in Christmas. Christ is the gift. Christ is the reason we worship and we bow. But who are you going to bow down to? Who am I going to bow down to this Christmas? Commercialism? Or the gift of Jesus Christ? Then they opened up their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense um, and of myrrh. Do you know the Christmas story? And in about three or four weeks, we're, we're going to talk about this. Did they do this? Did God just do, okay, I feel sorry for little baby Jesus. I feel sorry for Mary. Now they're being obedient. So now that the kid, Jesus, is about two years old or so, we're going to go ahead and we're going to turn him into a king. We're going to give him all these riches and glories and gifting and, and say, here you go, you deserve it, you deserve it. Why on earth did they get the gifts? Okay, exactly. God allowed these wise men. And were there three? There's probably more than three, by the way. All right. These wise men that came, came to present gifts to the king. But they found the true king of kings with the sole purpose of giving gifts to get Jesus out of Bethlehem. To get him out. Because if you read that story, you will read how Jesus was in trouble. How the ruler of that time was after all the babies. Literally. I mean, think about this. How awesome is Christmas? When we celebrate the wise men and all of a sudden we realize that there was a massacre of children during the season. Not just a couple kids, but a massacre of children to get after Jesus. Do you realize that, yeah, there's angels in the sky, the shepherds are walking, the wise men are coming. Do you realize as soon as the wise men arrived, Jesus had a warrant for his death. Merry Christmas. But Jesus said, you know the gift of Jesus? I ain't going to let anybody stop. I'm not going to let the purpose of this gift to be halted because of a stupid king and a stupid gossip and this massacre that went on. That's not it. God said, I love my son. I'm going to take care of him and his family. So he brought all this riches, thousands, thousands, and thousands of dollars worth of merchandise to fund a trip to Egypt and back so that Jesus would be rich, right? That Jesus would be taken care of. You have been taken care of too by the gift of Jesus Christ. 
For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me read that again. It says this, For the wages, the penalty of our sin is death. But the what? Gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So maybe this Christmas, just think about this. Just this, Maybe this Christmas when you give gifts to people, when you give them to your family, when you give them to your children, when you give them to your relatives, when you give them to your coworkers, why don't you, while you're doing this, tell them about the greatest gift available to them? The gift that they will receive will burn, it'll rot, and they'll probably not use it in three months. If you have children, your gift that you have spent $122 on will be broken in three and a half hours. <laughs> Why don't you tell your children, your family, about the greatest gift ever, and that is Jesus Christ? What gift are you giving that lasts eternity? Are you giving Jesus to others? Or are you giving just stuff that will pass away? Then the last one is this. And um, have, have you guys ever been to Donnie Sanders' house during Christmas? Yes. If you've never been to Donnie Sanders' house during Christmas, I, I'm saying Donnie Sanders' house, it's really your house, but he takes it over during Christmas, doesn't he? <laughs> Um, Donnie Sanders, and I, I, might, I might post a picture on Facebook, or it's probably already there. Donnie Sanders just goes all out for Christmas. He has so many, what? Lights. That the, if, if, the, if NASA would, like, fail, they would, like, say, go to the Sanders house. That there's a space shuttle. Find the Sanders house, and, and you would find Earth. All right? And it's great, and, and it's very festive, and it's, and it's very nice. And lights, to tell you the truth. I mean, the only reason why they had, had lights historically is, is to replace the fruit and the nuts that they would put up on the tree, the decorative stuff that they would put up on the tree. That's the main reason to, to when electricity came and they used to have candles. And if you do a little bit more research with Martin Luther, you'll, you'll be able to find more information about that. But I want to pause and say this. When you drive around Evansville, or you drive around um, just wherever, there are pockets of blackness in houses. Then all of a sudden you come across a house that has lit their house so that people can see Christmas stuff, right? There are even some roads that are specifically, it's a neighborhood that they, they spend their, their whole month decorating it. And they advertise and come up our street. Let's, let's light up this area. And I think that is a very beautiful but scary picture of what the world has become. Because we, through the power of Jesus Christ, are supposed to be the light of to the world. Let me read this to you, and then I'm going to go on. Then Jesus spoke again to the people. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of what? Life. Will have the light of life. When you drive around, and when you're driving, I want to encourage you to pray. Still look at the road, but pray while you open up your eyes. God can still hear you with your eyes are not closed, okay? So, Pray when you're driving around, but pray that the darkness that you see will become the light. Let me ask you, has your household, would it be classified as a house filled with the light of Jesus? That people see your house and it's lit up with the love of Jesus. Or when they drive by, they say, you know what, I know that family. They are dark family. They say that they're Christians. They say that they're Christ followers. But in reality, there's no light in them because of the way they live, they act, and they are. Let's do this. Catalyst Church, just imagine when you're driving around that every light that you see, let this be a symbol in your life, little pockets of light that you see. Pray for that family, that that family comes to know Jesus.
That the light that they're shining because of technology will turn to be the light that shines through their soul and through their life because they have a relationship with Jesus. But the darkness we see, pray also for the darkness, the dark houses that you drive by. And know that the darkness can represent and does represent the evil that's in this world and the darkness that is here, the darkness that is real, that we need to shine the light into the darkness. Let me read, read this verse to you. It says this. In 1 Peter 2, verse 9, it says, But you are, cho you are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. If that doesn't give you goosebumps, that you belong to God, you are in deep spiritual problems. You belong to God, that you may declare the praise of Him who called you out of what? Darkness into the light. At your workplace, are you light? Are you the light of Jesus? Or they see you as religious, a seasonal Christian. The light only shines. When you talk about church, the light only shines when, when you get a text message from Dave and says, have you read your Bible? Oh, I need to show the light today. Seasonal Christians, most likely, and I, I'm not God, so I cannot judge. Seasonal Christians are probably going to go to hell, according to what the Bible says. Devoted followers of Jesus Christ have the Spirit of God, have the light of God that will revolutionize your life. And yes, when you sin, yes, when you do wrong, you still have the light inside of you. And it's not a seasonal thing. So Catalyst Church, let's stop being seasonal Christians and being Christ-like Christians by showing and sharing the light in this very dark, dark world. Last verse is this, 1 John um, 1, 5-7. The message, this is the message we have heard from Him, and Him is Jesus. So these disciples, which we're going to be talking about um, more during our, our continual series of viral. Him, that we declare to you, God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. That's what I'm alluding to, is this. If you are seasonal, the light is not in you. Because the truth is, the light shines every single moment of the day. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. Merry Christmas. When we see light, ask yourself, and I need to ask myself, am I... Are we being the light? So this Christmas, when you're with your family, with, when you're with your relatives, you are going to be around people who are living in darkness. They are in darkness. Maybe this Christmas... You need to be, not, not maybe, this Christmas, we need to be the light to our family. We need to be the light to our loved ones. We need to be a light to our coworkers. Because maybe they're not going to be here next Christmas. You don't know how long these people are going to be here. And they might be, you might be like, but, uh, but we have a tradition of this. Yeah, break the tradition. Be the man or woman after God's own heart and say, you know what, this Christmas, before we do all the gifts, can we just read the Bible? Can we just read this short little passage that you heard, what was his name, Silas or whatever? The, what, yeah, him. All right, the guy in the, the cartoon, he's pulling his, he's, he's coming up and he's illuminated by the light. And the light, he shares out the story and didn't take very long. So imagine this. 
Take two or three minutes out of your Christmas. Even if we're, we're, you're in a dark area of, of a family situation and all of them are not believers, stand up. Be the light. You'll be mocked. You'll be ridiculed. You'll be laughed at. And you'll be shunned. But the light will shine from you and allow God, who is the light, to use you as you walk in the light. So we've got this whole situation over here. You've got the nativity. You've got the gifts. You've got St. Nicholas. You've got the light. You've got the Christmas tree. You've got the whole setup here. But I want you to catch this verse that revolutionizes what you think and what you see right here. It's Colossians 1.17. It's up on the screen. Watch this. Colossians 1.17. It says, He is before all things. And in Him all things hold together. He, Jesus, is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. So I want to encourage you with this. Last thing is this. Let Jesus be the forefront, be the center, be the focus of all of this. I'm not saying stop doing Santa. I'm not saying stop doing gifts or lights or Christmas. I'm saying let Jesus be the forefront of it and use all this other stuff for amazing opportunity to share people, to tell people about who? Jesus. Jesus.